Hey everyone, it's Tommy here with Outrider USA. Hope you guys are doing great today. We wanted to take some time to go in depth on the all new Outrider Coyote four wheel drive. Uh, this is uh, green four wheel drive we have here and uh, wanna go through some of the details on it with you today. Uh, hopefully you've already seen the feature video on the four wheel drive that shares the three different stories of uh, different riders doing different adventures. Uh, that video really shows the beauty and the capability of the machine. Uh, with this video, we wanted to go into a little bit more detail and really drill down on the vehicle itself, give you some up-close looks at the machine so you can have a better understanding of what it is, who it's for, how you use it, where to use it, and some of the technical details as well as far as how the machine is put together, different options. Uh, so lots to talk about. Hope you enjoy. And uh, yeah, let's get into it. The goal with the Outrider Coyote four-wheel drive was to pack as much off-road capability as possible into the most compact package possible. This machine is about six feet long with the footrest, uh, about 61 inches long with the footrest removed, and about 33 inches wide and 33 inches tall with the seat reclined. So that means that you can fit it in the back of an SUV or a van, mid-size SUV, many hatchbacks, and be able to transport it wherever you want to go without the complexity of dealing with a trailer or a hitch rack or other gear uh, that's ancillary uh, to your vehicle that you currently have on hand. So it's super compact, but it's also incredibly capable. So it's a true four-wheel drive system with a motor in each wheel. So it's got four motors in total. Um, so it's gonna be able to, to go through all kinds of really rugged off-road trails uh, on sand, through mud, pretty much anywhere you'd go with a normal ATV. However, instead of weighing 500 plus pounds, this machine only weighs between 205 to 250 pounds, depending on how many batteries you install in the machine. So it's super light. It's actually the lightest four-wheel drive out there uh, currently. So it's the world's lightest four-wheel drive vehicle and it's the most compact four-wheel drive available that actually has a seat. So there's skateboards and things that are out there in four-wheel drive, but this is the lightest and the most compact four-wheel drive with a seat. So it's super capable, it's super compact, but it's also incredibly long range. Uh, with its four battery bays fully occupied, you could have more than 100 miles of off-road range. So that's really unprecedented for a vehicle that's this size. Uh, it's incredibly uh, compact and capable, but it can go way out there and get you out all day long. So on top of those capabilities, you might be asking, well, who's this thing really for? So with the Coyote, we wanted to create kind of an open-ended architecture, a modular system that works for both able-bodied riders and disabled riders alike and anywhere, anyone in between. So you may be an athlete that has full body function. You may be someone in their 70s or 80s that wants to still get out to the tree stand or uh, move around your land. You may be somebody that's paraplegic or quadriplegic or you may have ALS and you want to get out to places that you used to go uh, before your accident or diagnosis. We've designed this platform to be incredibly modular so that with some adaptations like our tri-pin hand controls, a rider that has little to no hand function can still operate the Coyote. Or if you've had a stroke and half of your body has been affected, we can do single-sided controls uh, so you can operate the vehicle with just one hand. Also, we've got leg support options so uh, your legs can be secured when you're riding the machine. So there's tons of adaptive options. Uh, as far as seating goes, the seat is fully adjustable, so you can adjust the recline angle. You can also adjust your position forward and back on the seat. There's an optional air cushion uh, for extra comfort or anyone with skin sensitivity issues. We've got a seat belt, a lap belt that's optional for riders with uh, uh, core stability issues. We've also got a chest belt option as well. Cargo rack for carrying your gear is an option. We've got a tail light system, uh, 360 degree visibility whip that's an option. 
So there's tons of different options that the machine has, but again, the goal is to have a super capable off-road machine that can be configured for as many individuals as possible. So a very open-ended architecture on this platform. So one of the things that's really special about the Coyote is the suspension system. If you're familiar with trophy trucks and desert Baja racing, they use a trailing arm system that has very long travel and allows for a really smooth ride over really rough terrain at high speeds. Our Coyote also uses a trailing arm type suspension. And you can see here a long trailing arm, long travel suspension with an air shock and an optional coil shock. So what that means for you, the rider, is that even over the roughest kind of terrain, you're gonna have an incredibly, incredibly smooth ride with this fully independent suspension. We use a trailing arm geometry on the rear, but we've used an A-arm geometry on the front. The A-arm geometry is one of the most common geometries in racing and off-road vehicles. It's tried and true. It allows for long travel in a compact system, and it's also nice and rigid. So it offers excellent performance and a comfortable ride over rough terrain. Something that's additionally really interesting about our front end is that it all mounts on a four bolt pattern. So this entire front clip can be removed off of the vehicle with just four bolts. So that allows as much as possible for the system to be future proof as we invariably will make changes through the years. Um, this system can be easily upgraded uh, and serviced if need be. The braking system on the Coyote is very unique and just works excellently. So instead of being just reliant on the mechanical disc brakes, we've also got four wheel electronic braking. So these motors double as electronic brakes for regenerative braking, which allows you, the rider, to apply your throttle, but when you let off, your brakes can engage automatically. So it allows you to drive the vehicle with just the push and pull of one finger throttle and braking. So you can still use your mechanical brakes, but they can be used in addition to the four-wheel electronic braking. So you get an immense amount of stopping force. And you also, for riders with any reduced hand function, you don't have to keep that force on the brakes consistently as you're descending long hills. On top of that, it very much extends the life of your brake pads and it allows you to go anywhere you need to go and simply let off the throttle and the vehicle's naturally gonna to come to a stop rather than coasting and freewheeling away um, as you're coming downhill. So it's a great system, really works well, and uh, it's just a neat feeling to feel those strong electronic brakes kicking in uh, whenever you let off that throttle. So uh, moving on from the braking, I'm gonna show you how to turn this machine on, and that's very important. So this here is called the doghouse. That's where all the electronic connections come into the bike. Everything is watertight and sealed. So the machine can be rained on. You can go through snow, mud, whatever. It's not a submarine, so you're not going to take it to the bottom of the lake, but it's very well waterproofed, uh, and it's a very robust system as far as weather is concerned. So when it comes time to turn the machine on, you got a removable key here. You can insert the key, rotate it 45 degrees, uh, and then up here on the hand controls, there is a kill and arm switch. You're going to press that button. That's going to arm the system. You hear the controller fan turn on. And then your throttle is on the opposite side. So that's a thumb throttle. And you're going to ease into that throttle. And that's going to apply power. So obviously you can tell uh, four wheel drive there. And when I let off of the throttle, you'll see that all the wheels come to a stop. So that's that electronic braking kicking in, which again, recharges the battery as you use, as, as you use that regenerative braking. So we'll spool it up. And top speed on this machine as it's equipped is 22 miles an hour. So plenty of speed when you're going off-road. It's really a blast to ride. So. Very intuitive though on the controls, throttle on the right on this setup can be set up on the left or you can even have all the controls on the left or all the controls on the right. 
Steering is simple push-pull steering. It's indirect steering, so it minimizes any feedback as you're going over rough terrain. Braking is independent as well, so you're gonna pull that left front lever to operate that left front brake, and you're gonna pull the right front lever to operate that right front brake. So if you pull both front levers, that stops both front wheels with the mechanical disc brakes. There are no mechanical disc brakes on the rear because uh, that a lot of times will induce uh, tail slide and uh, kind of braking situations that the average rider does not want to experience. So plenty of stopping power with the electronic brakes back here uh, combined with the front electronic brakes and on top of that, the mechanical disc brakes. These disc brakes are actually 240 millimeters, so they're enormous disc brakes. That gives you a great mechanical advantage on the brakes as compared with a typical mountain bike brake that's about 160 or 180 millimeters uh, on the disc rotor diameter. So that covers the braking, the throttle. Also an important feature is reverse. <laughs> so we got a push button up here on the controls. When it's depressed, it's in reverse. And so now you can apply that throttle again. It's gonna spin on all four wheels, obviously four wheel drive in reverse as well. And then you just push that button again and you're back into your forward gear. So really intuitive, really easy. So you apply that throttle and you're in your forward gear with that 22 mile an hour top speed and regenerative braking. Push that button for reverse and apply throttle again. Now we're rolling in the opposite direction. At any point in time as you're riding, uh, just like on a dirt bike or any vehicle like that, uh, there is a kill switch. So if you're applying throttle, and for whatever reason you want to cut throttle instantaneously, you can hit your kill switch, and that brings all the wheels to a stop. And that just can be hit again, and then you're back in gear and you're rolling. Another important thing to mention with this machine is that it is fully programmable for power and for speed limits. Uh, it has three presets that you can rapidly change between. And that's really important, especially if you're having a lot of different riders on the vehicle or younger riders or first time riders, and you wanna make sure it's safe. You could set a speed limiter of three or four miles an hour if you wanted to. Uh, it has a peak power of about 5,000 watts on the machine with four wheel drive and with two or more batteries. So tons of power but you can turn that power down to just a couple hundred watts of power as well if you want to. So this machine can be really, really docile and tame uh, for first time riders or riders that don't want a lot of power or a lot of speed, um, or it can be turned up and it's just a lot of fun, super powerful and super capable. So in order to change through those presets, uh, there's two buttons here on the display. You're just gonna toggle between settings on the display you're gonna press and hold the left button, and then you're gonna to quickly toggle with the right while holding down the left, and that takes you between low power, medium power, and high power modes. So at default, we typically set low power at a quarter of the maximum possible power potential of the machine and a quarter of the possible speed potential of the machine and we set medium power at half the maximum power potential and half the maximum speed potential. And then high power mode is typically set at full power, which uh, depending on the setup, is typically around 4,500 watts or so uh, and about 22 miles an hour. So the great thing about that is while you have those three presets factory programmed, you can go in and change those presets to be either more docile or more aggressive for off the off-road situation that you're using the vehicle in. Um, so if you want it to be uh, very, very tame, you can absolutely do that through this uh, display. So uh, moving on, I wanna talk just a little bit more about um, seating. Uh, so again, this is the Rojo air cushion option. Uh, this cushion is removable, so you can do different cushions. Uh, this has an air valve that allows you to fine tune it uh, to specifically the amount of firmness that you want. So you can spend all day in the seat uh, and be comfortable. So if you have any disability that makes your skin extra sensitive, then we recommend getting with a seating clinic uh, to get just the right cushion for you because this is a baseline. Uh, but this platform on the seat 
allows you to mount pretty much any cushion that you'd want to as long as it's 16 by 16, which is a common size. Our standard seat cushion uh, isn't quite this long. This is a bit extended to allow for these larger air cushions. Uh, but again, this Rojo is a common option that riders want just to get that maximum comfort. The seat cushion for the seat back is removable, so it can be washed um, or it can be changed out with the particular type of cushion that you'd prefer to use. Lap belts, we typically don't recommend for someone unless they're using it uh, to hold uh, their lower body and their lap, uh, hold their lower body into the seat. Um, such as riders that are paraplegic, um, lap belts uh, are an option for riders, but they're not a standard option, just like you wouldn't belt yourself into a motorcycle or an ATV. And these belts are airline style belts, so they're really easy to use. Even with just a single thumb pull, you can release that latch without much trouble. The footrest here uh, that's on the front of the machine is adjustable as well. Uh, with just two bolts loosened up, you can loosen these two uh, bolts with a six millimeter Allen wrench and telescope this boom out for riders with longer legs or in for riders with shorter legs or if you want to transport the machine more easily. Also, angle can be adjusted in three different positions for whatever angle feels most comfortable with your ankles. For getting on the Coyote and getting off of the Coyote, there are a couple ways you can do it. Many riders will get on the machine from the front straddling this boom as they step over. But riders that are transferring from a wheelchair or riders that have trouble getting over this footrest uh, can transfer laterally onto the seat from another chair or from a, even a wheelchair. Um, to do that, uh, we have a quick release that's optional here on uh, this hand control. And that allows this control to fold down and out of the way. And then a person can slide laterally into the seat pulling their legs over and getting them into the footrest. So kind of two ways to load on the machine, either from the side or from the front. Generally more able-bodied riders will load from the front and riders with uh, a some kind of physical disability might choose to uh, load from the side. The charger on the Coyote is integrated. So it's really convenient, it's very fast, and it's a very robust system. It's built into the Outrider so you don't have to manage some separate off-board charger. All you gotta do is pull the dust cap out of the charging port. This is a really standard cord that you'd find at your hardware store that's provided with the Coyote. Uh, just plug one end into the Coyote, and then the other end is a standard uh, plug that you could plug in, into any uh, US outlet. We also have uh, plugs and cords available for Australian outlets and pretty much any power that you'd find in other countries. When you're done, just reinstall the dust cap. And charging typically takes about an hour for, for each onboard battery that you have on the machine. So the Outrider can have a maximum of four packs. So a little over four hours with all four batteries and one hour with a single pack. So the Coyote also comes with parking brakes standard now uh, for bro both front disc brakes. So you're gonna pull the lever and slide the pin through, and it's just that easy. So when you get used to it, you can even do it with a single hand. Uh, makes it really easy to set your parking brake. Works great. So you've got one of those on each hand control. Okay, so just a quick crash course on the air shocks on the Coyote. Um, depending on the particular machine, uh, sometimes they're equipped with rock shocks, sometimes equipped with Fox or Suntour. So there are a variety of name brands that we use for the Coyote. Uh, but on any air shock, you're gonna have an air valve here, which is a Schrader valve, which is like what you would find on your tire uh, to air up a normal car tire. Um, so you have to use a shock specific pump to pump up that Schrader valve. But depending on the rider weight, you need more air pressure. So these particular shocks have a max air pressure of about 350 PSI and a general idea on the air pressure that you need, uh, it very closely correspond, corresponds to your rider weight. So as a baseline for a 200 pound rider, uh, if you're 200 pounds, we'll put 200 PSI on the shock. Um, if you find that just rides too firm and you're not using much of your, your travel on your shock, 
you can let some of that air out and run at 180 or 160 or 140. Um, but this little O-ring here, this red O-ring, will give you a good idea of how much of that travel you're using. So if you find that you go out and ride hard and you don't get it down more than halfway through the travel, you might want to soften it up a bit. That's going to give you a better ride. Or on the other hand, if it's super squishy and the bike really sags when you sit on it, you got to add more air pressure. Uh, you can increase that by 20 pound increments and just try it little by little. Now it does take some pumping. Um, generally I find for each stroke of the pump you get about one PSI. So it's a lot of pumping, just a heads up on that. But you can't use a regular floor pump for that because you can't get the PSI that you need into that shock. So with each of these four air shocks, you'll generally want your rear air shocks to be at the same pressure, of course, and you want your front air shocks to be at the same pressure. But for some riders that might be carrying a heavier load or whatever, they may want more air pressure in the rear and less in the front or vice versa. So there's a lot of adjustability on that. When you receive the Coyote, it'll be set on a baseline for your weight, but you can fine tune it from there. On top of that, it does have some quick adjustments. Um, this particular rock shock, shock has three positions for the compression adjustment. It's got an open setting there. It's got a setting there that's firmer and then it's got a lock setting there that's really firm. Um, so we generally, on the Coyote, we're always gonna set those in uh, the least firm setting. Uh, then the red here, the red dial is for rebound. So generally, we find that faster rebound works better and slower rebound, uh, in most cases, is not ideal. So we generally set these a couple steps back from the fastest setting, or it's indicated by the rabbit on this, in this rotational dial. Um, so blue is for compression, uh, red is for rebound, and then your uh, regular Schrader valve there for your overall air pressure, which you'll fine tune based on your rider, your rider weight and payload and the surface that you're riding on. So that's a general crash, crash course on these air shocks, and uh, same thing goes for the air shocks that are up front. Another thing to mention with the shocks on the Coyote uh, is that uh, air shocks are a great all-around shock, but coil shocks can offer a better ride uh, for rough off-road riding. The trick with coil shocks is that they're not as easily adjustable for different rider weights. You actually have to change the spring on the shock to get a firmer or a softer spring, whereas on an air shock you can just do it with air pressure. So ultimately you can get a smoother ride with a coil, but it can be a little trickier to get just the right stiffness on the spring with the coil, whereas with air shock, it's a lot easier. So coil can be the ultimate in ride quality. Uh, air shock can be the ultimate in convenience and adjustability. And the middle ground would be a air shock in the back with an external reservoir that's gonna have a lot more air volume and be a lot closer to the coil ride quality without as much fussiness as the coil has. So you can get a, it's already an excellent ride on the Coyote with air shocks, but you can take it up even a step further with a, with a coil shock on this machine. But you gotta find that right spring. So again, on the seat adjustability, we've got adjustability fore and aft with this slider, and then we've got the angle adjustment in the back. Uh, to adjust on this slider, forward and back, there's a four millimeter hex Allen key here. And you're gonna loosen that about a full turn on this side and the other side and then you can slide the seat forward and back on the slider. Uh, once it's in position, of course, you just tighten that down and you're set to go. I find that a four millimeter ball end Allen that's on a T-handle is the most convenient for adjusting this if you're making a lot of adjustments on it, especially if you're using it in fleet operation or there's a lot of different riders getting on the machine. All right, so this cycle analyst display gives a rider a lot of information. Up on the top left there, we've got a general battery state of charge. Uh, so when that is fully black, it's, it's uh, full battery. And when that is fully empty, it's an empty battery. So uh, pretty intuitive there. Top left, we've got the battery voltage, which shows your state of charge. Uh, fully charged is about 50 volts even. And fully discharged is uh, just under 40 volts. Uh, so about a 10 volt window there in the operating range. Um, top right shows your distance traveled on this trip. Uh, top right also shows your amp hours consumed on this trip, and it toggles between those two. Uh, it can be set up to display other things, but that's the default setting uh, 
can also be set up to show kilometers per hour instead of miles. Um, and the whole thing can be done in metric if that's uh, preferable. Bottom left shows you the power used from the motor currently instantaneously. So this is 0 0.04 kilowatts, uh, which would be 40 watts of power just standby for the machine with the lighting and, and everything running the fans uh, sitting here idle. So if you're going down a big hill and you're uh, on the electronic brakes, you'll see that go negative as it's uh, putting power back into the batteries under that regenerative braking. Also, that'll go negative if uh, you've got the Outrider charging uh, plugged into the wall, or it would go negative if uh, you had a solar panel connected to the Outrider that was charging the machine. Um, on the bottom right is your speed instantaneously. Again, top speed on this uh, Coyote is about 22 miles an hour. Uh, on the bottom left, you've got your throttle position indicator. Um, so if you do push the throttle, uh, you can see your throttle position as you move through the range on the throttle. Um, and you'll see right here, this mile per hour starts blinking because uh, the bike's disarmed and uh, it's set to a zero mile per hour speed limit when it's disarmed. So even though you're giving it throttle, it's not gonna go anywhere. Uh, further into this machine uh, on the display, you can get a lot of information, but it gets pretty nerdy pretty fast, so we're not gonna go into all of it. But this left button toggles left through the menus and the right button toggles right through the menus. So as you're toggling right, you got a power screen. You've got a, uh, another screen that shows if you have a pedaling system on the machine, it can show you your human watts contributed, uh, the RPM on your pedaling. Uh, this screen we do use a lot. This is your watt hours per mile screen, which shows your efficiency. Uh, so if you have a, a maxed out 6,000 watt hour battery, for instance, and you were getting 60 watt hours per mile, uh, just rough math would say that you could expect 100 miles of range with that kind of riding on a full charge. Now the real world uh, capacity of a battery varies with temperature and life on the battery. Generally, just rule of thumb, we estimate um, the usable energy at about 90% of the nameplate capacity on a battery. So a thousand watt hour capacity battery, we would say usable capacity is generally around 900 watt hours. Um, so that's a rule of thumb. If you got a 3000 watt hour battery, that would mean you probably have about 2700 watt hours usable. Um, if you got 27 watt hours per mile, you'd have 100 miles of range on that battery. So just a quick crash course in the watt hours per mile. It's very similar to the miles per gallon reading uh, that we're all used to for cars. Uh, this is the watt hours that have been consumed out of the battery so far. Counting up. More pedaling related um, data there, which this machine has a footrest, so it's not relevant to this machine. Um, of course, you know, as we're comparing ATVs versus Outriders, that's a one that's a given, you know, advantage on the Outriders. If you're looking to get any exercise, Outriders do have options for pedaling packages that allow the rider to get some exercise as well. Um, this shows you the performance of your regenerative braking and how much power the regenerative braking has put back into the battery. So 3.1% energy recovered through the regenerative braking. If you didn't have the regenerative brakes, of course, that'd always be 0%. So anything is better than nothing there. So it's pretty cool to see what you get back on that. Um, these are your max values, uh, max charging uh, current, uh, max discharging current. Uh, minimum voltage. So again, a lot of this gets pretty nerdy pretty fast. Um, but top speed on this ride, average speed on this ride, and then the ride duration for this ride in minutes, seconds, and hours. Um, that is a temp menu that can be set up for different motors. Uh, total miles on the machine. This is your overall mileage that uh, can't be edited on the machine. So that's your, uh, this machine has just 13 miles on it from the factory. Trip miles is, uh, you know, you reset every time you charge fully, and that will reset the trip mileage and all these, these other temporary values. Um, total power used out of the battery in its lifespan is there in kilowatt hours. How many cycles are on the battery? That counts cycles every time you hit the reset button after full charge. So got to hit that reset button to get an accurate cycle count on that. Resistance of the battery gives you an idea of the battery health and also it's also dependent on the temperature of the battery. This is a diagnostic screen for all kinds of data on the machine. If uh, any troubleshooting needs to be done, 
Uh, this is a screen that gives us a lot of information to be able to assist with that. Um, then we're back to the main menu. Um, so after you put a full charge on the bike and you're up near 50 volts, you'd press and hold this right button to reset all your values and zero them out. It asks you if you want to do that, you say yes. And now everything's cleared and all your data is correct and zeroed out with a fully charged battery. Of course, I just reset it with a you know half to three quarter charged battery. So um, you wouldn't want to do that really. You want to reset it on, on your full charge. Uh, while we're talking about charging as well, um, you don't have to charge this machine up to 100% every time. It's fine to charge it partially. Uh, it's fine to leave it plugged in for a little while. Um, so it's very flexible as far as the charging is concerned. So that covers the display, a lot of capability here. If you press and hold this left button too long, it will take you into the setup menu, which gets pretty complicated pretty fast, but you would want to go in here if you did want to change your power limits or speed limits, but we'd want to work with you on that because um, you don't want to go in here and change settings that you don't intend to. So if you get in there, you can just turn the bike off and turn it back on again and that'll get you out of there. Or you can press the left button and that'll get you out of the setup menu back to the main. So just as a reminder, if you want to change your power levels, you press and hold the left and toggle with the right while you have the left held down. But remember, if you keep that left button down long before pressing the right button, you go into that setup menu. So just a little more detail on that display. One of the common questions that we get uh, on the Coyote is how it compares to a more typical ATV. It's a good question. The Coyote is really kind of the first machine of its kind. Uh, so it needs to be looked at in a bit of a different way when comparing it against an ATV. One of the things that I think distinguishes it the most is that the Coyote can be used in places that you just can't operate a typical ATV. Uh, most of that has to do with noise. We have riders that are using their Coyotes around their neighborhoods. Uh, it's totally silent. So that means that you can use it even on sidewalks. Uh, you can use it in your yard. You can use it in your park, uh, especially for riders with disabilities. Um, ADA allows them to operate these kind of vehicles pretty much anywhere that someone would go on foot. So the world kind of becomes your playground. And as you can imagine, operating a typical ATV in those more urban settings uh, would get a lot of attention and probably not good attention. So this machine uh, is very svelte, it's very quiet, it's very stealthy. Um, so not only does that give you an advantage in where you can operate it, but for riders that want to use it for hunting or getting around wildlife, uh, there's really no comparison between a typical ATV and this vehicle um, as far as the stealth component goes. Um, this makes almost zero noise uh, other than the tires just going over the leaf, the leaves or other surfaces that you're riding it on. Um, there's no smell that it leaves behind. So for hunting, it's excellent in that regard. And also has a low profile. So if you're operating in high grass or um, any kind of vegetation, uh, it's very difficult uh, to see the machine off-road. And that's a really great thing uh, when you're trying to be extra stealthy in the woods. So one of the biggest differentiating factors is where you can use it and directly tied to that is that noise uh, of the machine. Another element is transport. Uh, so obviously with this being so compact, it's capable of being transported in the back of an SUV or van. That's just not possible with a typical ATV because of the height of the ATV and also because of the sheer weight being uh, tipping the scales over 500 pounds where this comes in between 200 and 250 pounds. So much easier to transport. Uh, that's one of the, uh, the really key things with the Coyote. Also another element is infrastructure. So with a typical gas ATV, of course, you gotta have gas on hand, which for a lot of applications is no big deal. Um, we do have uh, buyers that are using this for really remote applications. Uh, and for those kind of applications, the Coyote can be charged with a solar panel. Um, with the electronics package and the solar accessory. So you could have this machine parked in the middle of nowhere with no fueling infrastructure, and it, you could keep the battery topped off with solar. Um, so that's a huge advantage in that regard. 
Another element that separates this from a typical ATV is the adaptive interfaces. So again, with the tri-pin controls and other adaptations, it's possible for a rider with little to no hand function or hemiplegic control to operate the Coyote, whereas that uh, just wouldn't be possible on a typical ATV. Um, aside from those practical comparisons, you know, I grew up on uh, traditional Yamaha ATVs and Honda XR dirt bikes, and so I'm a motorhead as well. Um, and I spent a lot of time on those, and I spent a lot of time on this, and it's just a totally different experience. Uh, it's not to say that ATVs don't have their place. They're a lot of fun, and they do have their place, but this is a completely different experience, and it's kind of difficult to describe until you ride one. Um, it feels much more uh, like an extension of your own body. It feels much more like an Ironman suit uh, that you kind of strap on when you get in. Um, and it's absolutely liberating and so exciting and enjoyable to ride. An ATV is powerful and fun in its own regard, but it's a very different experience. Uh, this is kind of more of an immersive experience where an ATV feels kind of more like, you know, kind of like you're riding a horse. So it's just a different experience altogether. Um, and I can see a place for both, but for riders that are looking for those particular components that I mentioned and that comparison, um, that's what the Coyote really excels at. Another thing about the Coyote that's really neat uh, as compared with a lot of other vehicles is just how manageable it is and its size and weight. So if you did manage to get stuck in the Coyote, uh, what's awesome about it at the weight it comes in at is that you can actually move it out of whatever you're stuck in um, and uh, manipulate it a lot more easily than a 500 plus pound ATV or something similar to that. So it's a lot more manageable. And with two people, you can lift up the Coyote completely uh, and move it around with just two sets of hands. So uh, that's something that's very unique about it as well. Even a motorcycle or something like that, uh, a dirt bike, larger dirt bikes can't be lifted with two people. Um, so that really is something that, the, that is very unique to the Coyote. All right, so that covers all the technical stuff. Uh, it's time to switch gears into some riding footage. I hope you guys enjoy, and we'll see you soon. Cheers.